What made you want to become a racing driver? Aha, that's a very good question. Um, I had no real interest at all uh, growing up as a kid because one, my father retired when I was when I was five, so that was the end of 1970, uh, and I grew up in Sydney. So we moved back to Australia, and I grew grew up there, and I was actually more interested in soccer, so that became a kind of passion of mine, and. Um, Never really thought about being a racing driver at all until I left school at 16 to work on, a, on my farm, uh, my father's farm in Australia. And because uh, I went to an agricultural boarding school to learn about agriculture, and I was actually grooming, my, well, they were grooming me to be a farmer. Uh, but I did enjoy speed. So when I was on the farm, I, I drove every vehicle, motorbike, didn't matter what it was, flat out and sideways all the time. So I enjoyed the speed aspect of it and balancing the car and feeling the grip. That that was something ingrained in me. But in terms of actually going into competition, no. And it wasn't until I went to America uh, when I was about 17 uh, to watch my brother race in Indy cars at the time. And I saw a go-kart in a workshop and had no idea people raced go-karts. And that was the spark of inspiration to maybe jump in a go-kart and have a go. So you won the 1989 British Formula 3 World Championship, having the most wins and poles of the season. What was it like to win the British Formula 3 Championship? Oh, it was a big deal, big deal, because um, you know so many great drivers had, had won that. And, and at that time, if you'd won a major championship like that, it gave you a super license to do Formula One. And at the end of that year, uh, we went to Macau for the Formula Three World Cup, and I managed to win that as well. And uh, that kind of launched me in terms of who David Brabham was as a driver. And, you know, the following year, I was, I was doing Formula One. Your father, Jack, had uh, quite a successful career, in, in particular in Formula One. Uh, did you ever feel pressured to have the same level of success in motorsport? Um, I think, you know, I think very few people have that kind of success. So I, I, for me, it wasn't really um, an issue. It was more about my own performance, the pressure of making sure that I delivered the best possible performance at every racetrack I went to. Um, and that's really the only thing I was really interested in. And even still, you know, when I get to a racetrack, that's what's on my mind. You know, I've got to go there, do the job, get it done. I'm a lot more experienced now than I was back in 1990 when I did Formula One. Um, but at the same time, the, the pressures are still the same. Uh, probably more so, I guess, you know, in the world of Formula One, it was, in, it was new for me. It was a big jump from F3. Uh, the Brabham team that I was with were going through some very difficult times financially and the car was late, it was unreliable and it just wasn't a, a very good year for, for Brabham in general. So, you know, unfortunately for me, I hit them at the wrong time. And so, you know, I went out of there back, you know, not back, but into sports cars for a few years before I went back to Formula One in 94 with Simtech. But when I did, uh, I was a lot more... Um, an established driver and a lot more experience where you know I got the maximum out of what I had where I wouldn't have said I got the maximum in F1 in 1990. So was your father helpful as a mentor in your career? I um, mean yeah, he was to a point but he was very much like my two older brothers uh, look that there's the steering wheel I can't tell you how to drive you've got to figure it out yourself and that was his attitude and it was probably the right one too because you know, we had to learn. We had to we had to learn and do it ourselves. And we, you know, my brothers and I have developed developed a career of our own through those principles. And if we had a problem or, or he saw a problem, yeah, for sure. He spoke and when he spoke, he didn't speak a lot, but when he did it was it was always right and spot on and he could assess the situation really well from his experience. So who was the biggest uh, role model in your career? Oh, I think, I think uh, uh, many. I, I don't think I have one in particular. I think you can draw inspiration of so many different people, whether they're in the sport or out the sport, that inspires you to do, to be more than what you think you're capable of. Um, so I, I kind of look at it that way, not by one particular person. Um, 
I was close uh, and still am close to my older brother Jeffrey, and 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 he was the one that I went to America to to watch, and and you know he was he was you know the inspiration to, me to start racing because I was involved in his environment when that when that happened, uh, but in in general, you know you could you can draw inspiration off. You know, someone you've just met in the street who just tells you an incredible story that inspires you, you know, or your kids, they do something and that it inspires you. So that's the way I look at it. So the first Formula One race you tried to qualify for was San Marino in 1990, uh, but you didn't qualify for it. So your first race was actually Monaco. Yeah. So some would say it's a rather difficult track for someone to start out at. Uh, was it difficult racing at Monaco for the first race of your Formula One career? Um. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't easy because we had 30 cars going to 26 slots. So, you know, there was, a, there, was, there was always that danger of not qualifying, which did happen in the year, uh, which obviously happened at San Marino. You know, we, I got my car the day of first practice at, at that weekend. And I think, I don't know how many times it stopped on track. So by the time I got to qualifying, I'd hardly done any laps in the car. So it wasn't very good preparation. And then it was straight to Monaco and, you know, uh, against the odds, I think, I ended up, you know, qualifying 25th out of 26. So I was, I was pretty pleased with, you know, the jump that I had made and there was still more to be gained, but qualifying for your first Grand Prix at Monaco is, is pretty special. There's no doubt about it. And, and driving a, a Brabham at the same time. So you mentioned before that it was difficult going from Formula 3 to Formula 1. What uh, was the most difficult change for you? Uh, there were so many. There was the, 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 obviously the speed of the cars were, were very different, a lot more grip with a Formula 1 car. Um, I didn't get a lot of testing leading up to my first event. And I think the team dynamics and politics that were going on at the time I had never had any experience in, in, that, in that area. So, um, you know, I kind of went in, got chewed up and spat out type of thing. And, and I learned a lot from, from that whole environment. You know, that's for sure. For most of the 1990 season and the entire 1994 season in Formula One, uh, you were the only Australian driver on the grid. What was it like to be the sole driver from your home country? Um... Well, I think at the time, you, 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 I, I don't really think of it in you know, Australians come on the seas and get the backing and support that they needed to compete over there. Um, at the time, you know, Australia were not investing in that area and, and still don't to a point. So I had to, you know, leave Australia and try and make it on my own in Europe without the support of Australia, but always proud of kind of where I grew up and, and where I was from. And, um, you know, it was, it was obviously, there was a few really good drivers that came through, obviously Mark Webber uh, being the next Aussie in F1 after me. And then, uh, you know, with Daniel doing so well, it's, it's, it's great to see. So you were on the grid for the 1994 San Marino Grand Prix, uh, the race in which we lost Roland Ratzenberger and Ayrton Senna. Can you describe some of the emotion amongst the paddock on that day? Well, to be honest with you, after Roland had gone as my teammate, you know, what the rest of the paddock were doing, I had no idea because we were so, so caught up in the emotion of losing Roland as part of our team. Uh, I can only tell you how difficult it was in, in our own pit box you know it, we shut the shutters down and you know none of us had ever experienced losing someone like that so it's really difficult when the emotions are so high to, to really know what to do or even what to say you know you are kind of stunned by what's happened we know it's dangerous we know it can happen but it's so far in the back of your mind you kind of convince yourself it ain't going to happen and then when it does, it's 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 you know it's a shock of reality that hell this is this is dangerous and it can happen, um, and it was it wasn't easy you know it was uh, very very difficult times for not just us but for Formula One in general after that weekend. 
But, you know, there's always a, a silver lining in a black cloud. And, you know, so much came out of that weekend that saved probably so many drivers' lives in the future with safety going up massively with tracks and the cars and uh, the way they, um, you know, the, the head protection, the Hans devices, you know, we, we probably should have had more deaths. But because of that weekend, we haven't. So, you know, it, it helped us. So Roland being your teammate on the SimTech team, uh, you guys were driving nearly identical cars. So uh, was there ever a point where you were frightened about what could have happened in an accident? Um, obviously, I didn't know <clears throat> that we there was any particular issues until Roland had his accident. Um, and then, of course, I was asked, you know, do I want to race or not? And I really didn't know what to do. Um, like I said, when you're in that situation, you just don't know. Um, and I decided to do the warm-up. And, of course, I had to be convinced by the team that, that they had found the problem and fixed it. Um, because, you know, Roland went off the racetrack the lap before, slowed down and, and zigzagged, like, to check the car. <clears throat> and it must have you know, hit the front wing and, and damaged it. And then, of course, when he's gone for another lap, he didn't make it and the front wing came off. So it was clearly um, a front wing issue of some type from the hit or whatever, so it needed to be strengthened. Um, and then, you know, in the morning when I went to the track, you know, I, what I saw and, and I had to put my belief in the team that, that what they were telling me was, was correct. And, that, and I decided after the warm-up, because we had a, a relatively competitive warm-up, that um, it lifted everybody's spirits a little bit. I mean, a tiny bit, but enough for me to go, we've got to keep this, this going. So I decided to race. Yeah. So you completed the 1994 season. Uh, why didn't you continue your Formula 1 career beyond 1994? Well, money. <laughs> the team ran out of money. And they needed um, to bring drivers that could bring budgets. Um, Verstappen uh, took my place and he brought a lot of uh, Benetton technical support, which saved the team from me. And uh, like I said, Australia were not really putting their money behind Australian drivers at, at that point internationally. And, um, you know, I, I struggled to, to find the money to continue and you know I, I, I had another offer to often do British touring cars as a works BMW driver and um, you know it was a tough 94 season and, and decided that um, you know I'd go off and do that and maybe one day get back to Formula One but then you know I enjoyed you know getting the sports car experience so much that I didn't need to go back to Formula One I was happy with doing sports cars. So after Formula 1, you raced uh, in the 24-hour of Le Mans uh, quite a few times, ranking first in your class in 2007, 2008, and 2009, and finishing in front of the entire field in 2009. Uh, just how different is a 24-hour race compared to a standard length race, which we see in Formula 1? You know what, it, it, it is, I mean, it's a race is a race, but there is a different mentality to a 24-hour race for sure. I mean, you take a lot more risks in a Formula One race or any sort of sprint race than you would in a 24 hour. You still, you still have to drive fast, consistent, you know, without mistakes, don't hit anyone, you know, the normal scenario. And, you know, those races are generally won by good, strong pace, but, you know, the least amount of time in the pits. And for three years in a row, touch wood, luck, whatever, whatever it was, I, I had three perfect races where we spent the least amount of time in the pits and we were fast enough to win. And we may not have been the fastest, certainly in 2009, but having the right strategy to look after the car because there were some issues with the front splitter braking if you ran over the curbs a bit too aggressively and that cost you in lap time. So it had to, you know, you had to hold back a bit to make sure that uh, we didn't have any issues. And of course, the two other cars that we were racing against with Peugeot had front splitter problems because they were faster and they were running over the curbs quite aggressively and they had to keep changing splitters. So 
every time they got in front of us, they were behind us trying to catch us again because, you know, we, were, we, we had a different strategy and that paid off. And, and you know, we, we essentially had, had, for me, the third perfect race in a row, which is not easy at Le Mans. <laughs> so you're working on uh, Project Brabham, which is a team in the World Endurance Championship. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. It's, um, I guess, 10 years ago, I thought, you know, what am I going to do when I retire from driving? And, you know, we've got one of the most iconic racing names in the sport, but as a family, we've never really done anything with it. So I started to look into what, what I could do with it. And I didn't know at the time, just knew that there was something that we could do. And then I uh, discovered that someone had registered and owned the Brabham name in Germany and was starting a business over there. And uh, I felt, well, I, I wasn't happy about that. So I ended up going to court and, and it took seven years of uh, three court appearances in Germany to, to get the name back, which we successfully did uh, Christmas Day 2012. And then it was a case of, okay, what is Brabham? So we did a, a brand research on, on the name, what it meant to people, uh, whether it's fans, drivers, engineers, people who own Brabham's, you know, all sorts of people were interviewed. Um, and there was, there was some key things that came out. One, it's inspirational. Two, it's pioneering. It's innovation. It's engineering. So whatever we do with Brabham in the future has to have that as a kind of DNA platform. And then having been in industry a long time and realizing that, you know, if I was to bring Brabham back into racing, I'd had to find a different way of doing it because the current model is a difficult one for race teams to survive. Um, and I just felt it was time for a change. So we started looking at what that change might be. And we decided that we would position ourselves as a brand coming back into racing as a as a kind of content provider for fans, drivers, and engineers to really get involved in a race team that they can't do anywhere else. And, you know, so we're going to bring back the Brabham Racing Team. It's, it's going to be open and transparent, and we're using that vehicle as a way of giving people a really unique motorsport experience where they can feel they're part of the team, uh, they're engaged, they're contributing ideas, they're voting on things. Uh, and everything that we learn from the sport, you know, from a driver's point of view, from the fitness side, from the psychology side, the driving side, uh, all the engineering learnings that we can do, you know, through what we call Brabham Digital, which will be three digital portals for um, Brabham fan, Brabham driver, and Brabham engineer, which is a subscription-based model. So people can subscribe and get that access. And, you know, it is a knowledge sharing and e-learning platform. And we can create lots of learning modules within our team that helps people around the world. So it's a completely different concept, um, but one that's really exciting because, you know, we did a crowdfunding campaign last September, October, and we had the biggest sporting crowdfunding campaign ever at that time. Uh, we raised £278,000 in six weeks. We've got 64 countries involved in the program already, and that's just off an idea. That's, we don't even have a product yet. So that's get behind us, what do you think? And, and it's just been incredible, the response. I think the timing is right for something like this, and, um, you know, we've got a very strong brand that people will be attracted to as well as what um, the open and transparent sharing the knowledge and the e-learning that we can do through a Brabham race team. So the team will be going into the World Endurance Championship. Uh, why did you choose uh, that series to go into? Well, we needed a, a global series. And, uh, you know, like I said, we've got 64 countries who've contributed to, to our campaign. So uh, a world championship is, is kind of a must. You ain't going to go and do Formula One straight off the bat unless you've got a gazillion dollars, you know. Um, but the World Endurance Championship is, is growing really nicely. The manufacturers are starting to come in. There's more and more publicity about it. Uh, it goes around the world. And, you know, for LMP2, you can go and buy a car, get the team up and running, 
start building Brabham Digital around the race team to then eventually develop the team into potential LMP1 category where we can actually design and build our own car with, with the help of a community of engineers around the world as well. Um, and that's an exciting project that, um, you know, we're, that, that's what we're planning to do. And uh, who knows from there on, you know, obviously the ultimate goal would be to see Brabham back in Formula One. But first, first things first, and, and let's establish the team, get it up and running and, and do the WEC, do it well, um, bring in the partners needed to do an LMP1 program and, um, and then see what happens after that. But, uh, you know, we, it's, it's like I said, it's a, it's a really exciting project with lots of possibilities. So right now you've done some crowdfunding to get the team started. Are you looking to fund the team just entirely on just crowdfunding or are you looking for some investors to run the team? No, we're, uh, the, the crowdfunding was to test the market to see whether or not people liked the idea, whether they got behind it, which they did. Uh, we've done a couple of other surveys on top to make sure we've got more data. And uh, we just finished the prospectus, the investment prospectus for, for Brabham. Uh, and we're just starting to talk to investors now. So um, that's where we're at. So you are in very early stages of creating the team, but do you have any potential drivers in mind? Uh, to be honest, uh, no. I, I mean, you know, we get, when, as soon as we launched our crowdfunding campaign back in September, uh, we had something like, no, I think it was 150 uh, CVs from all sorts of people wanting to be a part of it. And I got quite a few phone calls from drivers and, and whatever. But, you know, to be honest with you, our main focus has all been about um, uh, getting getting the, the, the business structure together about who we are, what we're selling to the market, and we've done that. The prospectus is done. Brabham, the first stage of Brabham Digital is up, which is what we promised when we did the crowdfunding campaign is what we would focus on. And, you know, the, at the end of the day, you can't do anything unless you've got the investment. So that's our full focus. Drivers and things like that, once we've got the money, we know what we're dealing with. You know, can we pick and choose drivers or do we need drivers with, with budgets or, or what? You know, the plan is not to be like that, is to get the proper investment to get the right drivers who... You know, would have to fit our profile, you know, because, you know, you're going to be very exposed to our type of program. Um, and you've got to be able to contribute and share your knowledge and understanding to a community of, of either fans, drivers or engineers who are interested in, in that content. So do you have any idea when the team will be ready to go on the grid? Well, the plan is to be on the grid next year in 2016. Um, but again, a lot of it will depend on when the investment comes. So yeah, we'll see uh, how that, that goes. But uh, with the timing of everything, and yeah, we, we, we should be able to get on track by the beginning of next year. So you haven't raced as many races as you have in the past in your own driving career. Do you plan to continue racing while you're running your team? Well, I, you know, the last uh, two, two and a half years, I've, I've put my career to one side. And I've, I've had, um, obviously, some driving with uh, ESM and in the P2 car for them, which is the Honda, which I know very well, the HBD P2 car. And uh, it kind of worked because it was three, four races in the year while I was still focusing on, on Project Brabham. And uh, that still remains the same. You know, I may do some races later in the year, but primary focus is, is to get to get this program up and running. Where my driving sits amongst all of that, I, I won't make a decision till I know that we've got through this next phase. So if you're, in, if you're successful creating your team, your career will be taking a whole nother level. Uh, but uh, so far, what's been the greatest memory of your career? Oh God, I've had so many. I've been so lucky to have um, won a lot of races, a lot of big races, championships. Yeah, I loved my time in America with the American Le Mans series. Um, you know, 2008 up against Penske and Porsche, uh, Dyson Porsche, 
and the other Acura teams was a definite highlight. And probably for me, I was driving it probably the best I've ever driven at that point. And I really had to dig deep to try and beat Porsche and Penske. And we did, we did on, on, you know, on a regular occurrence and we just missed out on the championship. Um, you know, they were great times. All my 18 Le Mans that I've done have, have just been fantastic experiences. Winning Bathurst with my brother in Australia, winning the Spa 24 Hours, you know, winning F3, um, being in Formula One as a Formula One driver. Um, yeah, I've been, I've been spoiled, to be honest. I've lived the dream. Well, a career in motorsport surely has many positive points, uh, but what do you think are some of the negative parts of a career in this area? I think, you know, if I've always been a paid professional. So ever since I landed over here in the UK, I, I've never bought any money. So I've always had to rely on my talent. And, of course, if you don't have the budget, you can't pick and choose where you want to go. So you end up having to find the next person or team who's prepared to pay you in a professional environment to do a job. And sometimes those deals didn't come up till March. So nearly every Christmas, you're going into the unknown of, am I going to pick something up? I always did. And sometimes... You know, sometimes it was it was uh, not a great financial deal, but it kept me going. Um, and that's, that's again, living the dream in a sense, but in a tough way. Because uh, you don't want to do anything else. You just want to race. And, uh, you know, there, there were quite a few years where I would say, man, that was difficult. That was difficult in a financial sense because they couldn't afford to pay me a lot of money. You know, I got bills and, you know, also, you know, normal sort of situation. Um, and in sports cars, you don't earn the huge sums of money that some of the top Formula One drivers do. You know, you earn enough to live and, and, and pay your bills, and sometimes you can't. You know, it's difficult. You've got to find other work or other ways of bringing money to supplement it. Um, and that's, that's been my life. And, you know, I'm now moving from being a driver to, to setting up a business and, and bringing you know, my father's legacy and everything that he achieved in the Brabham name and, and taking it forward, which is really exciting as well. So what's been the favorite track that you've raced on in your career? Oh, I have, there's lots of great tracks around the world, which I've been on, you know, you know, the, you know, the, the I, I've got no order. I'm, I'm someone, if someone says, who's your best driver? Well, I don't really have one. What's your best racetrack? Well, I don't really have one because there's so many great tracks, you know. Um, and I've always found the policy works well if I don't have a favourite track because I treat every track the same. If I had a favourite, it means I have a least favourite. And when I get there with a least favourite track and try and do my job, that's like an anchor. That's kind of holding me back because my attitude towards the track is not right. So I've trained myself to say, well, I have no favourites. I'll just do the best I can and enjoy what I've got in front of me. And um, that's what I've done. But, you know, when you've raced at, you know, Monaco, you've raced at Macau, you've raced at Bathurst, you've raced at, um, you know, Le Mans, uh, Spa, uh, you know, Road America, um, Road Atlanta and Laguna and Sears Point. I mean, there's so many nice tracks, you know, tracks in Japan like... Um, Suzuka and um, Autopolis, yeah, they were fantastic tracks. So, yeah, very lucky to have, have driven great cars on some great tracks. Do you have any tips or wisdom you'd like to share with uh, drivers who are looking to get into a motorsport career? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, giving advice, there's no magic bullet. Um, I guess that you need to decide, are you going to be that magic bullet? Are you going to make it happen? Are you hungry enough? Do you desire it enough to succeed? And will you, when the times are tough, will you get back up, get going? And, and it's, it's having that, that blind faith that it's going to happen because, you know, our lives go on so many different paths by the way we view it. And sometimes an opportunity could be just around the corner and we've given up and we've gone a different direction. And, 
you know, if anything, it's, it's, you know, my advice, if I had any advice, I guess it would be if you, if you want to know your future, just look in the mirror and then look at yourself and say, am I doing enough? Am I positive enough? Am I working hard enough to achieve this? And if I'm not, then I'm not going to make it. So I've got to change. I've got to do something about it. But it's, it's you that's got to do something about it. And then things will happen. Okay, well, that's all the questions I have for you. Is there anything you'd like to add to anything? Or? Uh, no, not really. I think um, you know, it's 30 years of a career to try and get through. But, uh, yeah, no, I mean, it's... it's it's been you know, a great, great period of my life, you know, and um, my, I'm, you know, I kind of feel like I'm only halfway through it. So uh, I've, got, I've got a whole new uh, world in front of me and um, I'll apply the same principles that I've done in my racing with the business.